And in this year of all years, the iconography, if you like, of the monarchy and of Queen Elizabeth II has been more prominent than ever before through this summer and the Diamond Jubilee celebrations. Interesting, though, Kate, how much we have seen the Queen but not heard her. Oh, no, we never hear her. I mean, we've seen Charles do interviews, her other children do interviews. We'll never see the Queen do an interview. And she speaks very, very rarely. We have short speeches. So the first time she ever did speak was in 1940 when she broadcast to the children of America who, who she was talking to them in the hardships of war. So we're really not very used to hearing the Queen. And that, I think, is one of the, the great moments, the great, the great skill of the Queen, is that she simply is so incredibly politically neutral, so incredibly subtle, and she doesn't impose herself in our lives and here the magnificent sight of the royal procession the Windsor Greys leading and drawing the first carriage which of course contains Her Majesty the Queen His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh Lord Valentine Cecil who is the fourth son of the sixth Marquess of Salisbury served as a major in the British Armed Forces worked in NATO in the Ministry of Defence and also Lord Irwin who appeared in the Royal Procession for the first time yesterday with his wife Georgia and today Lord Owen in the first carriage. And the Queen's there looking marvellous. She's wearing her dresser, her favourite dresser, Angela Kelly, a pink panty silk and wool mixed dress, a matching hat and the coat. I mean, she looks marvellous. She looks like she could be a, a, a strawberry ice cream. <laughs> Lord Irwin is the one in the grey top hat and Lord Valentine Cecil closer to us in the black top hat. And it's so wonderful to see the Duke of Edinburgh there. I mean, he was back, of course, in the Trooping the Colour, but he has been out of action after his bladder infection. So great, again, to see him by her side. She's our longest married monarch. They've been married for 64 years. I mean, it's incredible to see him there, the longest serving consort, and back in action, back to watch the, the racing once more, and perhaps to see her win today. In the second carriage, we have Princess Alexandra, the Honourable Lady Ogilvy, Mr John Massara and Mrs John Massara and Air Marshal Sir David Walker. Now, John Massara is the Deputy Chairman of the Australian Racing Board. I mean, he owns Arrowfield Stud and they stand the very good stallion Redoute's Choice. And he's also Chairman of Racing New South Wales. So, Australian guests at Windsor Castle and the Queen ensuring that the message of the Diamond Jubilee spread all around the Commonwealth and if she can't go there, she makes sure Send that someone else. Exact, no, no, send somebody else, but also make sure they come here. I think the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall are going to yes, Australia and New yes. Zealand later this year. Whizzing all over the place. She's our most travelled monarch as well. No one's travelled as much as the Queen ever. In the third carriage, we have Lord Vesti there, who was just taking his hat off. Opposite him in navy blue is Lady Vesti, CC, his wife, and Mr and Mrs Tony Bedison. And again, they are Australian and Tony Bedison is very involved with the Melbourne Children's Hospital, which when the Queen last visited Australia, he took her around that hospital, and there's a rather sweet photo of them together looking at the meerkat yes, enclosure. Yes, exactly. Gorgeous day to be in the procession. Slight breeze coming down the course, so not too warm bright sunshine. And the whole grange of the procession was exactly what you were saying, Claire. It really is about showing off the monarchs. Increasingly these days, monarchs really don't exist until we see them. So when Queen Victoria hid herself away in, in terror, because after the death of Prince Albert, people were very anti her. In that final carriage, we have Georgia, Lady Irwin, whose husband's in the first carriage, and Mr and Mrs Simon Brooks Ward. And Simon Brooks Ward organises the Windsor Horse Show. He put on the, the royal pageant there, and also Olympia Horse Show. And Lieutenant Colonel Dan Rex is the fourth member of that carriage that Simon Brooks Ward closest to us with the glasses. And you can see the haze there. It looks pretty hot. But you can never show heat, of course, if you're the Queen. You're never hot and you're never cold, not like the rest of us. You have to always, always survive. So do you think in the time of George IV, was the procession the same length as this, four carriages or more? It could be sometimes longer as well because they were so much more used to travelling by carriage than, than we were. So, and George IV was terribly grand. He, wasn't, he was our most pompous, excessive king. Queen Victoria after her, after him, just tried to remodel herself as much more modest. So I'd imagine George IV would have many more carriages. And of course, you know, it, it, you know it's, it is, it's, it's a royal procession beginning, first of all, with, with Queen Anne, who began Ascot herself in 1711, the first races as a consequence of her being so close and being so close in Windsor. And I think it's particularly fitting today that the, the horse we're all hoping for 
Carlton House is, is named after George IV's palace, I mean, it, which is also our great lost palace because George IV created it when he turned 21 and came into the large sum of about five million pounds a year. That was his yearly sum. So, you know, but he couldn't, that, was too, that wasn't enough. His, his stables alone cost nearly three million pounds a year. So he, was, he needed more cash. And he created this wonderful house, Carlton House on Pall Mall, full of amazing objet d'art, amazing art, so beautiful that when, when he opened it to the public, there was such a crush to see it that some ladies had the coats torn entirely off their backs for the passion to see the objet d'art. It was marvellous, but then he tore it all down in, just after he became king in, in 1825, and so we've lost it for history, but hopefully Carlton House will keep some of its spirit. And I think it, there still is a Carlton House, and I think just no, no, not far from, I, I assume, right on the same spot, and it's one of the government residences. Yes, the, 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 the Carlton House terrace remains, the area remains, but the actual amazing house that the Prince built, well, he was a fashion leader, he built it, and actually, oh, I'll tear it down. Focus on Buckingham Palace now. Buckingham Palace, of course, the scene of, of so much of the celebrations, whether it was the, um, the procession and the balcony appearances or indeed the concert and that special stage that was built around the QVM, as we call it, the Queen Victoria M Memorial. The incredible Diamond Jubilee celebrations. I mean, the last monarch who ever had a Diamond Jubilee was Queen Victoria, and by her period, she was exhausted, she was lame. The last thing she'd be doing is going to the races. She was far too exhausted. Whereas our Queen, she's hale and hearty and whizzing around and traveling and full of beans, and you know, what a boost today will be to her if her horse wins. Pretty exciting. And racing, of course, has always been so vital to the royal family. Uh, Edward VIII, Edward VII was, the, was a really great racehorse owner. He was incredibly successful. And he had a rather marvellous horse called Diamond Jubilee because the horse itself was born in 1897, the Diamond Jubilee year. And that was rather successful. Won it yes, and pretty successful. won the derby in 1900. Very bad, very bad temper, though. Is that After, right? Yes, he used to kick the jockey sometimes and occasionally the odd member of the public. And when it was put out to stud, it escaped and ran through the town. It was pretty naughty. A naughty horse, but very spirited. So he was a pretty successful race, race horse owner, Edward the Seventh. His son, George V, quite good, and George VI also. But the Queen really has revivified that great royal tradition of race horse owning and been incredibly successful. And I mentioned earlier that the last Group One winner that the Queen had was in 1977. 1977, Diamond Jubilee, the uh, Silver Jubilee. And she's had 20 winners in Ascot over, yes. overall, hasn't she, in the actual royal meeting, but more overall. I mean, she's, I mean it's incredibly. How, how impressive it is that she is queen and she's so busy doing queen things and at the same time a very successful racehorse owner. The Prince of Wales not in the Royal Procession today and indeed not making the presentation of the Prince of Wales estates, which he normally would do. Um, Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal will do that instead. And the Countess of Wessex also making presentation today. She'll be doing the Royal Hunt Cup. The Queen herself will make two presentations this week. Tomorrow for the Gold Cup, which is the oldest race of all at Royal Ascot, and on Saturday for the Diamond Jubilee, which obviously has been renamed, was the Golden Jubilee, the six furlong sprint for which Black Caviar, the Australian supermare, is an odds-on favourite. And who knows, we might have another Jubilee in 10 years' time, and we'll have to rename again a Platinum Jubilee. That would be extraordinary. I wish she could do it, just another 10 years. Has any monarch in the world done that? Well, actually, she's got a few people to beat. 72 years on the throne, that's the French, Louis XIV. So that's her next record once she's, once she's beaten Queen Victoria in 2015, uh, September 2015, she'll beat Queen Victoria to be Britain's longest reigning monarch, then Louis XIV, the European longest reigning monarch. Pretty good. I think she could do it, what do you reckon? and then pausing because the national anthem will shortly be heard.
national anthem from the band of the Coldstream Guards and around the race course, men removing their hats and people singing as the Queen and the Royal Procession now turn left, make their way through the tunnel that takes them underneath that grandstand and will re-emerge on the paddock side, do a full circle of the paddock and dismount by the weighing room actually where people crowd around there to try and get a good view of the Royal Procession and it, a smaller crowd today and not surprisingly because I do think Frankel attracted a lot more race goers yesterday and the weather forecast was always good for Tuesday. Just a slightly lower key feel today but nonetheless enthusiastic and excited I think about the racing ahead and many people come just for this you know that the people get the impression of, of Royal Ascot as, as being a sort of huge social occasion where everybody wants to be seen and see others but actually the, the big draw is the Royal Procession. Yes yeah, so I think you absolutely get very close to the Queen and we really see her and we really see her at something she's just so overjoyed to be at she's such a keen racer so fond of it and she's always been eager ever since she was a little girl one of her favorite wedding presents also was a was a marvelous filly from the Arthur Khan so she's a great a great owner and a great fan of horses and we really do get really very close to her and 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 I think we've seen a lot of her this year in, in the Diamond Jubilee year we probably will start to see a little bit less of her as the years go on so I think we should grab our chances and you were mentioning Queen Victoria's record, 63 years, wasn't yes, it? Yes, she was, she was a long-living monarch. So she got there to 1901. And, but the world's longest reigning monarch is of Swaziland, the King's Lothar of Swaziland, who did 1899 to 1982. So he was pretty, pretty good. I think the Queen may not beat him. I may not be around to see it. Huge applause here around the paddock and you could see how, how this was, was designed to make sure that people could get the best view possible of the Royal Procession. When they relayed the race course, they took the, and obviously built the new grandstand, they also moved the paddock and, and part of the, the major condition of that was have enough room to have obviously 30 horses if you can have a maximum field, which we do today for example for the um, Royal Hunt Cup, but also bank the steps and make it look lovely so that when people do come down for the Royal Procession they actually, you know, it's, it's perfect for it I and mean, it's, it's probably the best designed paddock I've seen anywhere. I think you're exactly right and so many other times when we see the monarch, the balcony wave, the other processions, they are quite a long way away from those. Balcony waves are always marvellous but it's pretty hard to see them in the flotilla, she was in the middle of the river. Here you get really quite up close to them and we could throw over paper aeroplanes if we were to want to. <laughs> she might not be really pleased about that. And the horses who have come down from the Windsor Mews and will have come through Windsor Great Park and will make their way back to the Mews after their circuit of the paddock here. A few of them getting warm because it is a very warm day, and particularly here where you're out of the wind, but behaving themselves impeccably. Of course, it's such a great day for the royal family today. It's that William is 30 tomorrow, so it's a chance for the big knees up tomorrow and royal our royal family have big parties the night before the queen's wedding her father led a conga through the, through the state apartments with all the foreign royals so who knows what they're all doing tonight it could be having a wild party for william <laughs> some lovely shots there just as the carriage turned off the race course and you can see the particular dappled greys don't they look gorgeous they look fabulous fabulous like old-fashioned rocking horses they really do, which of course the Queen had so many of when she was a little girl. She loved the rocking horses and practicing riding on them. She was such an eager rider. And the Queen and the Royal Party will now make their way up to the Royal Box. Johnny Weatherby there, who's Her Majesty's representative on, on the left and took over newly this year from the Duke of Devonshire. 
and Charles Barnett, the chief executive here at Ascot as well, deep in conversation with the Queen. And I suspect the Queen giving an accurate going report because obviously she's the first one that actually comes yes, down the track. She comes down the track yeah. and she does know very well. I mean, she's done it so many times. She knows very what's happening. She thinks about the, the, the quality of the grass and she'll be looking at it very carefully today just to see how Carlton House might might go, might win. I know there is that added, you know, free of excitement and nerves as well. well because yes. it's a big, big day for him. Kate, thank you so much.